Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. One of the most requested topics I've had recently to talk about is Andrew Tate. And I will be honest, the sheer amount of content that he has put out and that is already out there about him is overwhelming at this point. And I was like, I don't know if I can add anything new to this or if I do, I don't really know where to start. But then I found something that I wanna talk about that I haven't seen anyone else talk about yet. And it's the fact that Andrew Tate has a book so, I did some research and I found that on his website, Andrew Tate describes himself as I'm Andrew Tate, world champion kickboxer and multi-millionaire. I grew up broke and now I'm a multi-millionaire. I teach the deserving the secrets to modern wealth creation. And like I say, then I went away and I found all these countless articles about him and podcasts about him and videos about him and just people talking about him all over the place. But one thing I didn't see much talk around was his book. So of course I went away and acquired a copy for myself. One of the first things I found is that in his book he describes himself in the following way. Right, if you don't know who I am, where the fuck you been? I'm Andrew Tate, four times kickboxing world champion, the world's sexiest man, confirmed, a nice guy, millionaire, etc. People often ask me to do a podcast and I'm far too lazy. He also says to himself, you can't slander me because I will state right now that I am absolutely sexist and I'm absolutely a misogynist. I have fuck you money and you can't take it away. So I'll say what I want because I'm a realist and when you're a realist, you're sexist. There's no way you can be rooted in reality and not be a sexist. He goes on, so I'm a sexist. I'm a misogynist. I'm misogynistic because I believe that females are weaker than men. That makes me a bad person in the feminist's mind. So we already know right off the back, this is a quality piece of literature right here. This book is gonna be remembered for generations. It's gonna have an impact on the world. <laughs> But I mean, seriously, Andrew, there are a lot of reasons why I and many other people think you're a bad person and you being a self-proclaimed misogynist is only one of many, trust me. So this book is called The Tate Bible and it is an absolute joke. It literally opens with a prayer directed to Andrew, which reads like it should be satire. But honestly, his ego is so big, I think this is probably meant seriously. Oh my God. And then of course, there's an image of Andrew Tate photoshopped onto a painting of Jesus surrounded by glowing women. You just, you can't make this stuff up, can you? Just, you literally cannot make this stuff up, can you, baby? No. At a first glance, the chapter titles also didn't fill me with a lot of confidence. You have the likes of, do girls love money? Laws of the pimp game. My life as a pimp. I know, I'm curious. Tate on female friends. How slaves think. And of course the classic, violence is necessary. How is Amazon still selling this book? So before we dive deep into this book, and trust me, we are gonna be diving deep, let's get a little bit of background on who Andrew Tate actually is. So Andrew Tate was born Emery Andrew Tate III and is currently a 35 year old influencer who has previously worked in kickboxing and tried to get on reality TV like Big Brother before he was kicked off because videos of him violently beating women were released to the public. Not even an exaggeration. He then began to create online content about how to be a man and all that rubbish and he's absolutely blown up. He's huge on TikTok even though he doesn't really post that much himself. He gets other people to post video clips of him with hundreds, maybe thousands of accounts dedicated to sharing clips of Andrew talking. Some of these clips have literally racked up billions of views, which is terrifying. And you have to ask, well, why are so many people sharing this stuff? And turns out it's all part of Andrew's weird little pyramid scheme that he's got going on. It's very bizarre. Andrew created an online course called Hustlers University, so you already know it's gonna be bad, in which he gets boys and men to sign up for his courses on manliness and making money, and he tells them that they can be as rich as him if you just buy my course. Yeah, one of those. And while he is absolutely raking in money through this and other means, he currently has apparently 127,000 people taking his 39 quid a month course. So while he is raking the money, he has also been known to just blatantly lie about how much money he makes. It's very odd. 
so I found one article uh, that spoke about this saying, speaking about his personal wealth, he recently said in an interview, I was broke for a long time, I made my first million when I was 27, and then I had 100 million by the time I was 31, 32, and then I became a trillionaire quite recently. Except there are no trillionaires in the world. It is not possible. He's literally talking out of his bum hole. That said, he is estimated to be worth around 30 million, which is still a terrifying amount and more than he deserves, but nowhere near what he claims he makes. So he's just a compulsive liar, I think, let's be honest. Anyway, why do I call Hustlers University a pyramid scheme? Well, part of the way he teaches people to make money is by getting them to get more people to sign up for Hustlers University and then they get a commission for that and then they get more people to sign up and get a commission, and then they get more people to sign up to get a commission, and so on. He specifically tells people to post the most controversial and wild clips of him online to attract attention, even when it's negative, so they can direct more people to sign up for the course and get more commissions that way, and then they go on to recruit more people and get commissions, and so on. Basically a big MLM. Okay, so we've established Andrew Tate is stirring up controversy to make money. We kind of know he's a troll, what's the issue? Well, he's not really just a troll. He's a very dangerous man. The problem is a lot of Andrew Tate's controversial clips are at the expense of women. He talks about violence against women so casually and literally encourages other people to act violently against women too. So here are a couple of quotes from Tate and about Tate that I found in various articles and things written about him, things that he said and so on. He also thinks rape victims must bear responsibility for their attack and dates women aged 19 to 20 because he can make an imprint on them. It's bang out the machete, boom in her face and grip her by the neck. Shut up, bitch. He says in one video acting out how he'd attack a woman if she accused him of cheating. In another interview he said, I inflict. I expect absolute loyalty from my woman. I ain't having my chicks talking to other dudes, liking other dudes. My chicks don't go to the club without me, they're at home. This isn't just talk though, this isn't just him threatening violence and being like ha ha ha, hit the woman, threaten her with a machete, no. Tate has literally been investigated by the police for domestic violence, assault and literally rape and also human trafficking. There have literally been numerous videos of him showing him attacking and beating women. He literally brags about how he moved to Romania in order to avoid the rape charges against him in the UK because, and he says, this is probably 40% of the reason he moved there, he says in one video, adding, I'm not a rapist, but I like the idea of just being able to do what I want. I like being free. This is literally a dangerous man who is actively harming people and encouraging others to do the same, and he is being enabled and promoted by apps like TikTok in particular. One video of him on TikTok in particular literally has 11 billion views. That's not just, oh, some people found it and watched it. That's, TikTok is pushing this content, promoting his content to young and often vulnerable young men. And that's not okay. So that's my rant about Andrew Tate in general. Let's look at the absolute bizarre mess that is his book, The Tate Bible. This book is co-written or ghostwritten by a man named G Slim, who says his first reaction when he saw Andrew Tate's Twitter account was, I won't lie to you, I genuinely still thought it was a parody account. I could not believe anyone actually thought like this. Surely it was a wind up. Honestly, I think we were all thinking similar things when we found Andrew Tate, weren't we? But G Slim, as he calls himself, gets sucked in. He watches a crap ton of Andrew's content and he says, on this journey of discovery, I noticed one thing kept popping up in the comments. Tate, you should write a book. Several times I saw this and when he bothered to reply, Andrew would scornfully say the same thing. I ain't got time to write a book. I'm put too busy driving a McLaren through the Alps. You can't argue with that but something clicked in my head. As someone who had rapidly consumed most of the Tate media in a short time, I realized that he'd already written a book. It's just no one had put the pages together yet. I decided I would complete the book in total secrecy and then get a physical paperback version printed and give it to him. This I hoped would get the seal of approval. So I began the long and arduous task of reading every tweet he'd ever posted and watching every video he'd ever made, again. 
but this time finding the best bits and transcribing them. So this book wasn't even Andrew's idea. He didn't actually put any work into this. I'm still not even sure he even really knows about it or has read it, but he's put his name to it and he's making money from it. And everything in this book are absolutely his words. And that's why this seems like the perfect thing to review because it's basically just a big summary of all his online content in one place. Podcasts, tweets, blog posts, interviews, everything, all in one little ebook. It, ugh. And it's awful. When G Slim says these are the best bits, what he means are the most horrifically bad, disgusting bits all in one place. <sighs> And then this little introduction from G Slim ends with him saying, all brilliance in this book is Andrew's. Any mistakes are mine. Like how brainwashed is this man? It's ridiculous. Give me a second, I'm gonna go change my jumper because this is warm and I'll be back in a moment. All right, sorry, we're kind of past the worst of the heat waves, but it's still stiflingly hot here. It's ridiculous. The book opens with a quote from Andrew and I, like about himself. And I think this tells us so much about him. He says, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Hard to get my tongue around that. <laughs> he literally has the biggest ego known to mankind and prefers to appear smart rather than actually get his point across succinctly, you know, and clearly. Like, I would say I'm someone who reads a hell of a lot and is pretty well educated and has a pretty extensive vocab. But for me, people like Andrew who just use a bunch of big words for the sake of it in this way just never impress me because they're clearly doing it for themselves rather than to actually make a clear point, you know? You don't throw out vocab like this because it's the best word, you do it because he's trying to show off. If he actually wanted to make himself clear to his audience, he'd do that. Anyway, it's just an ego thing, it really is. And funnily enough, he proves this ego thing in his very first chapter when he writes, I've justified my ego and I do have a massive ego. I like me, and I like that I am me. I think I'm the fucking man. I think I'm cool as fuck, and I'm happy with that. And I'm happy to live my life this way because I find it a source of motivation. I encourage every man out there to have an ego, develop an ego, a massive one, and then work to justify it. I love egotistical people. I love people with huge egos because they try hardest and they try hardest to justify them. By which he means he loves men with huge egos. Women aren't included in this because he doesn't see women as people. God forbid a woman should have any self-confidence. <sighs> no, 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 no. And then what's actually really funny is that he's like, there are two sides to ego, when it's deserved and undeserved, and someone should really come up with different words for those. Except we have. We have self-confidence and egotistical. They're already different. Andrew Tate is not as smart as he thinks he is. It gets worse later in the book when he writes, understand that I am too brilliant a man, too perfect in every single metric, too big, too strong, too smart. I can fight too well. I'm caramel, I'm beautiful. It would be a shame for me to not service these females. I am a gift to females created by the one above. That's what I am. Trust me, mate, if anyone gifted Andrew Tate to me, I would be giving it straight back. I'm like, no, thank you. Let's talk briefly about the overall content of this book. In summary, it's bad, like really bad. It's literally just a series of transcripts from various interviews, podcasts, and video rants by Andrew. And that's why the writing style is so horrible. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard Andrew Tate talk, but it's mostly just incoherent rambling where he scrambles from one thought to another, repeats himself a lot. He reminds me a lot of Donald Trump speaking. There's a lot of words, but no real substance. And so this book literally reads like that and it's awful. Nothing has been done to translate this properly to the page. God, there are so many typos, so many grammatical errors. The syntax is reminiscent of a toddler who's had too much caffeine. It's just awful. If you showed this to a publisher, they would laugh you out of the room. Plus, the way the book is organized overall is a mess. There is no cohesion. There is no overarching theme or narrative. Chapters are just stuffed together so you have one random thought and then another random thought with literally no intention to how they're organized throughout the book. It's 
horrible to read. It's absolutely horrible. Like, so some of the later chapters cover exactly the same stuff as the earlier chapters, even down to the same sentences being used on, say, like, page 30 and then page 100. Like, the same stuff, they're repeated. But, at the same time, while you have some chapters that cover the same topics, you also have chapters that outright contradict each other. It's very bizarre. Um, and at one point, there are about three pages that are just repeated straight after the other. Like, I'm not even joking, look at this clip. I thought I was going crazy, I thought there was a glitch in my book, but it's not. He just copied and pasted the same thing twice for like three pages. Oh my god. So, because this book is such a mess and there's no organisation to it, and it's literally just like one topic, another, 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 oh that one again, and that, like, there's no organisation to it. So. Just like we did with the Rouge V video, the first Rouge V, re, the, the first Rouge v video I made, um, I've organised this video into sections where we're going to look in each section at a different topic that Andrew Tate writes or speaks about and then critically analyse them. So we're not going through the book in order, we're going to jump around a bit throughout different parts of the book, but I've organised it into hopefully cohesive sections that make sense, which is something G Slim should have done, but couldn't be bothered to, because just like Andrew Tate, he's lazy as hell. So let's open with the least egregiously bad thing about Andrew Tate. He just seems like a really dull person who doesn't know how to hold a conversation. All these things he talks about doing, all these experiences he's apparently had, all the things he's, he says he enjoys, it all just sounds really, really materialistic and shallow and boring. Like, really, really boring. So, there's this bit in, one, in the book where he talks about all the things that make him happy. And he says, So I'm thinking of all the things that make me happy. In fact, my beautiful physique. I'm like fucking Hercules. My Lambo. My house. My bitches. My kickboxing world titles. Whatever I do, whatever I enjoy the moment, all had to be earned. It's dull as hell. I don't care what car you drive or what house you have. I care about hearing what someone's passionate about, what they care about. I care about their opinions, their hobbies, what they do for fun, what they think of the world, who they are as a person. Andrew is just like, my Lambo, my house, my bitches. I'm like, oh, you're a bit boring, aren't you, mate? I genuinely enjoy hearing people tell me things like their thoughts on books they read, art they saw, things they've made, new hobby they tried. Um, tell me about what you did on a recent trip that you took, or tell me about that cute little thing that your dog dig did at the park today, or, or anything like that. That's what I want to hear about, that's what's interesting about people. But Andrew Tate is just like, I got these cars, I got these bitches, and I'm fucking beautiful. And it just sounds so dull. There is no substance to him at all. I feel like if you tried to talk to him, he'd just spend the entire time listing off things that he has, rather than actually saying anything interesting or anything of value. He's this typical person who has no personality, and so com compensates by just listing off things that he's recently thrown money at. And then he literally goes on a rant about people who enjoy themselves at concerts, and calls them morons, <laughs> because he's insecure. He says, the kind of people who jump around nightclubs are extremely happy, but they have no stoicism. You can see these people in the club. Yeah, the club. Britney Spears, Rihanna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Morons. I could win a hundred million dollars and I wouldn't scream like that. All these people are screaming because Rihanna's on stage 40 metres away at a festival. No wonder the world's fucked. So extremely happy of a dumb shit. <laughs> God, he's such a... <clears throat> he's so moody isn't he? And boring. Like, I don't think he understands how fun it can be for so many people to go somewhere and have a dance, have a sing-along, cheer for talented people doing something they love. Like, like, he doesn't have to find it fun himself, but at least understand why other people find it fun, you know? He just sounds really dull and like he needs to lighten up a bit. And if you're this bothered by seeing other people enjoy themselves and celebrating someone else's achievements, like, how insecure are you? You'll, you'll see this a lot throughout this entire book. Andrew Tate is a very, very unhappy, insecure little man who's trying his best to hide it all with this macho bravado, and he just ends up simply projecting his internal hatred onto women and other people in an attempt to make himself feel better, and it's actually really, really sad. If he wasn't such a dangerous man, I'd actually feel really sorry for him, because it's very clear he needs so much therapy. This continues as he goes on on to talk about women, because he says, 
I don't see the point in having female friends. Any real G out there knows it's true. You got your girl, or your girls, girl you're fucking, or girls you're trying to fuck. There's no room for that other shit. If they don't want to fuck you, and just want to sit there and talk shit and waste your time so you can buy them dinner, no, don't do it. I don't need female friends. If I tell a girl we're gonna fuck and she says I don't want to fuck you, okay, well we ain't gonna talk anymore. What the fuck are we gonna talk about now? We ain't gonna fuck. So what are we gonna talk about? Vampire Diaries? Get the fuck out of here. All this says to me is that Andrew Tate doesn't know how to hold a conversation. <laughs> He's telling on himself, isn't he? If you can't talk to 50% of the population, then that's an issue with you, not them. Because plenty of other men can and do hold damn good conversations with all kinds of people, including women. It's very bizarre. But with that in mind, knowing what a dull and boring and insecure person Andrew Tate is, he's here to teach us how to be interesting. <laughs> he's here to teach us how to be real men. And whatever. <laughs> so let's take a look at that. So we all know that Andrew thinks real men should be traditionally manly and that there's only one way to do that. But what is it? Well, apparently it starts with something very important. Not cooking. I'm not, I'm not even joking. This is absolutely ridiculous. He goes on a several page long rant about how real men don't cook. Hmm. And again, it just screams insecurity, but this time also immaturity. It feels like it should be satire. It really, really does. But somehow it isn't. It's so weird. So he tells us about this friend from school he was hanging out with. And then the friend says to him, anyway, I'm hungry. You want something to eat? Perfectly normal thing to ask a friend you've got around at your house, right? Like, yeah, mate, you want something to eat? Not for Andrew Tate. He says, I was like, nah, I'm fine, bro. So then he gets his ass up, a full grown man, and he starts to cook himself something to eat. Now I know what you amateurs think. What's the problem? This guy's just making some food. But amateurs don't understand the world because amateurs do not analyze the world as a professional, which is what I am. I was analyzing the action of this individual and I completely understood why he will remain poor for eternity. If you're broke, if you're not a millionaire, the last thing you should be doing with your time is cooking. I, this is my Andrew Tate impression. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to be douchey, okay? I can't think of a lower return on investment activity than walking to the fridge, getting out some ingredients and, ooh, an onion. Oh, look at the onion. I'm gonna start cooking onion and some lettuce. And I get my knife, cut the onion. You're broke. You're fucking poor. You can get a rotisserie chicken for five bucks. Boom. Chicken. Bang. Eat. Bang. Back to work. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, Andrew, because everyone wants to spend their life eating plain roast chicken and nothing else. Does it not cross his mind that some people and I know this is a crazy thought, some people enjoy cooking. They actually find it quite fun. Some people enjoy eating nice food. Some people enjoy the process of cooking a meal with another person, for another person, for themselves. It's an act of self-care for some people. Not everything has to be about, yeah bro, but like, how much money can I make from this? <laughs> it's such a bizarre way of seeing the world. He says, I can't believe this. If you're broke, there is zero reason why you should ever prepare a meal. If you're a multimillionaire and you're a boring one, not a fun one like me driving fast cars, and you have all the time because you're rich and you want to cook, sure, waste your time. But if you're not a multimillionaire, your time is extremely important as a man. It needs to be dedicated towards world conquest. There's no need to prepare food. Either order something which can be done very cheaply and very helpfully, like chicken with a bag of salad for five bucks, or instruct a female to provide sustenance, eat, and get back to world conquest. <laughs> Some fucking dork thinks he's a tough guy, that a real man cooks real steak. 
<laughs> but you know what a real man actually does? A real man gets in the cage. A real man becomes a four-time kickboxing world champion. A real man has millions. A real man has supercars. A real man has a property portfolio. A real man has the police chief of the city he lives in on fucking speed dial. <laughs> That's what a real man does. A real man doesn't sit in his fucking broke ass house with his ugly ass wife cooking steak. You know why I cook steak? As a real man? I instruct one of my seven girlfriends, meat, now. Boom, it turns up perfect with Tabasco on the side and a nice glass of ice water. I do shit. That's how a real man cooks his steak. I swear I have never seen a more insecure man than this. If you have to sit there and go, I'm a real man, I am, I am, I'll tell women, meat, now. Then I don't think you're much of a secure man, are you? Oh my god. I think... <clears throat> I, think <laughs> I can't read this without laughing. Um, I do think this says a lot about Andrew, that his only way to feel secure in himself and his masculinity is to put down other people and mock them for the things they enjoy. If you can only be like, yeah, I'm a real man, and like you, and like, you can only feel secure in yourself by putting other people down, you're not very secure in the first place, are you? It just sounds to me like he doesn't know how to cook and look after himself, and he's aware of how immature and pathetic that makes him. And so his defense mechanism is to be like, ha ha ha, I'm just totally choosing not to do it, unlike y you dorks, cause, cause I'm a man, yeah? <laughs> it's just, it's very sad, isn't it? It's very sad. Literally everything that he thinks makes him look strong and manly is just dripping with insecurity. And like I keep saying, you will see this throughout the entire book. Like this, he says, do not watch other people's Instagram stories. Don't do it. I've never in my life watched someone else's Instagram story and improved my life or mood. Because it's probably one of two things. Inane, boring bullshit that doesn't interest you. Or something amazing going on to make you feel that bit of jealousy and envy. Oh no, I'm so scared that other people might be enjoying themselves, so I never take an interest in anyone else's life. Ooh, look how secure and manly that makes me. Again, it's the most insecure thing I've ever read. This stuff legit legitimately reads like satire. Watching people's Instagram stories is completely and utterly a waste of time. And of course there's a caveat for this, because if you follow me on Instagram, you should watch my stories because I'm the fucking man. But beside me, there's absolutely no need to watch that shit. If you want an interesting Instagram story to watch, you should be able to watch your own. <laughs> This has to be a joke! Now the thing is, I know to some extent social media and things like Instagram can be harmful. It's very easy to compare ourselves at our lowest points to other people that we only ever see at their highest points. And I think we need to be aware of how fake and curated social media can be and not let that affect us negatively. However, if you get this insecure and upset just by seeing another person even remotely happy, then you clearly have some major self-esteem issues that you need to work on. I know for me, if I'm having a bad day, and then I see one of my best friends post something like amazing and happy and lovely, like maybe they're saying they've just performed a great show, or they've got a new single coming out, or they post a cute video of their dog doing something adorable, like, that makes me happy. I enjoy seeing my friends celebrate the good moments in their life. I, seeing my friends happy and achieving things does provide me value. It does bring me joy. And I don't believe it's a waste of time at all. And I think if you're a person who can't even see your friends being happy without being this insecure and jealous, then you really have some self-esteem issues you need to work on. Andrew, you hearing me? I do feel sorry for Andrew because he clearly doesn't have anyone in his life that he wants to celebrate, or it sounds like really wants to celebrate him. And it does make me kind of pity what a boring, lonely life he must have. And like, we, we do, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not just making this up. We see evidence for this. Like a little later, he literally says, I don't believe that anyone else has my best interests at heart. 
I believe the only person who genuinely cares about me and my life is me. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in context later, but that's really sad, right? He's in his mid to late 30s and he thinks no one else in his life actually cares about him other than himself. That's really sad. He clearly has very low self-esteem and he's very insecure. And it's, I, I do pity him. I really do pity him. For more context as well, I want you to hear how he talks about happiness in general. Kind of as a little throwback, if you've seen my first video that I made on Rouge V, there was a whole section in there where he tried to convince people that happiness was a myth that didn't really exist, right? Andrew Tate does something similar, but different, but just as sad. So he says, how I feel has no impact on how I live my life. I don't think happiness as an index is a healthy view for a man to have on life success. Women are different. Women just wanna be happy. Women just wanna smile. They don't care how. They don't care if they deserve it or not, as long as they get to smile. But I think for a man, if you're waking up and asking if you're happy, then you're looking at life wrong. For a man, if you move your happiness down the scale and start looking at it, am I successful? Am I competent? Am I achieving things? Am I respected? If you start looking at these indicators of your life instead, you're gonna end up being happier without actually analyzing if you're happy or not. And this to me just kind of sounds like a miserable man who's trying to justify how miserable he is and bring everyone else down with him. Like I know plenty of happy men who love life and have achieved things while being happy or, or who are happy without achievements or anything in between. Like there's no one right way to exist. For all I've laughed at Andrew and his like real men don't cook and all that rubbish. <laughs> like, Reading passages like this, especially the ones where it's like, yeah, no one cares about me and stuff like that, like, I do have such conflicting feelings because I feel sad for him. I pity him. And I know he's just a sad man in a lot of pain who won't ever admit that and won't ever get any help for it. I know this is why he is the way he is. But then, as I always say, this is an explanation, but not an excuse. He is still absolutely a vile, dangerous, violent man, and even though this cripplingly low self-esteem and clear misery might explain why he's so nasty and violent towards women and other people, it might explain where this behaviour comes from, it doesn't by any means excuse it. So I have really conflicting feelings because I feel pity for him, but that doesn't give him a pass, you know? And while we're on this topic, this feels like a really good point to bring in Andrew's views and statements about mental health issues, specifically depression. This section might be really hard for some people to hear, so just bear that in mind. Now, if you do want a man who writes in a really respectful and helpful and relatable way around depression and anxiety, then I thoroughly recommend the writings of Matt Haig. His books like Note on, Notes on a Nervous Planet and reasons to stay alive really helped me through a lot of stuff. His work is excellent, his writing style is excellent. Um, and I also recommend if you are feeling depressed or have any mental health issues, stay as far away as possible from Andrew Ch Tate. I think that's gonna be your first step to helping yourself. But Andrew writes in his book, my most famous tweet when I said depression wasn't real and I had a list of celebrities. I had the girl from Game of Thrones. I had fucking literally a list of guys I argued with all these people and everyone told me how dangerous my mind was and that it's dangerous to believe you can control your own mind. Do you see what I mean about this reading like incoherent rambling? Nothing here makes grammatical sense. He can't even finish a thought before he's jumped onto something else. It's horrible to read. Depression is not a thing anymore. Feeling depressed is real. You can be depressed with your situation. I just told you, number two, get depressed. That's fine. But believing you can fix it yourself is the important key. Sitting there believing that depression is some monster from the sky that strikes your brain and now you have no control over your life and you must take pills every day is the absolute enemy to a G mindset. But I have to disagree with him. I would argue that when you take steps to make yourself feel better, like taking medication you need to help with an actual chemical imbalance in your brain or seeking out therapy or some help like that, that is taking control of your life. Admitting you have an issue like depression and seeking help for it is taking control. It is something to be commended. It's not something to be belittled. I completely disagree with Andrew here. And then he goes on to be 
so incredibly disrespectful. And honestly, I believe this kind of talk does far more harm than good. You can't just shame ill people into feeling better because you don't understand what they're going through. He says, I refuse to collapse mentally and give up. I will know the only person who controls my mind is me. Nobody's going to save me. No doctor with a pill is going to save me. Depression isn't real. Depression is a state of mind designed to motivate you to find a life that doesn't depress you any further. That's all it is. Now you have to decide. Are you man enough to go and get it done or will you sit around and cry? I tell you something. You're not depressed. You're a coward. Definitely does more harm than good. You're desperately trying to defend this crippling ailment you have. When I tell you depression isn't real, you message me pages and pages desperate to convince me I'm wrong, that depression is a real thing and your life is terrible and this ailment has destroyed your life. You're desperate to defend your excuse. If depression was really terrible, you wouldn't want to defend it. See what I mean? He doesn't understand it. Replace depression with cancer and see how ridiculous this sounds. I tell you, cancer isn't real. If cancer was really terrible, you wouldn't want to defend it. Just because people are telling you something exists, that doesn't mean they like it, and that doesn't mean it isn't an awful experience for them. No one likes cancer, but they're still gonna tell you, hey, cancer exists and I have it. It's not an excuse, they're just telling you what's wrong with them, and then seeking out the correct treatment for them. And then, and this is the worst part, he says to people who commit suicide, if my kid did that, I'd be pissed. What a fucking moron. I wouldn't even give him a funeral. I just think it's ultimately selfish. I think it's super, super selfish. And I think that may be one of the most disgusting things I've ever read. Like, n none of this part is laughable. It's just really, really disgusting and harmful. But then what do we expect, really? Andrew clearly doesn't understand the basics of science, as demonstrated by his absolutely ridiculous conspiracy theory filled rants about COVID and lockdown. His views are harmful, but also laughable and incredibly selfish. He says, My view of the world is simple. The weak have always been crushed. It doesn't matter whether it was a religion or an ideology or a skin colour. The weak have always been subjugated and crushed. This is the law of humanity. So when I look to people who continue to put on their mask and have not yet woken to the fact that COVID is a scam, continue to comply and sit in their police states and obey, all I see is people who deserve to be destroyed. Ah, yes. Anyone who actually cared about anyone else and wore a mask to try and protect vulnerable people from getting severely ill and dying, they're simply weak and deserve to die, or as Andrew says, be destroyed is literally sickening, isn't it? Sickening. I think it was about like two years ago now, I made a video on anti-maskers and how ridiculous they were and how selfish they were and how unless you had medical exemption, there was no real reason to not wear a mask in public at the height of the pandemic. Like it's literally wearing a mask is not harming you. It's barely an inconvenience. And even if there was only a tiny chance it would save, li save lives, which wasn't true, it was, you know, pretty damn effective. It's proven to help a lot. But even if it was just a tiny chance, then it should be worth it. Andrew goes on to write, with all this crazy shit, these people deserve what's coming to them. It's slavery. It's nothing less. And you know what? Death is not the worst thing you can hope for. Death is not the worst thing that could happen to a man. Slavery is the worst thing that can happen to a man. And you're gonna allow yourself to be a slave without realizing what they've taken from you. They've taken your job. They've taken your freedom. They've taken the future financial security of your children. You have nothing to lose by standing up and rebelling. What do you have to lose? If you stay at home with a mask on, then you deserve what happens. You deserve it. Now, maybe I'm the crazy one in all this, but I don't think I am. But personally, I find being asked to wear a mask to protect the health of others being compared to actual, literal slavery, incredibly offensive and disrespectful to every single person who actually suffered because of slavery. And seriously, like, <laughs> if you stay at home with a mask on, you deserve what happens. What do you mean you deserve what happens? You mean you deserve to stay healthy and safe and have your loved ones protected? Yeah, you're right. I think you do. Because that's what happens. 
The selfishness continues as he talks about vaccines, and yet again, we see it all just stems from massive insecurity. You might recognise the line you mentioned earlier here too, and like, I, I would seriously love a psychologist to go through all his stuff and properly analyse this man, because there's clearly so much going on, and other than seeing that he's very insecure, like, I can't say anything really for certain about him, but it's just, this man has issues. Like, he really, really does. He said of COVID and the vaccine, I'm not gonna get the jab. And the reason for that is, I don't believe that anyone else has my best interests at heart. I don't believe that my school really cared about me. I don't believe that the government really cares about me. I don't believe that AstraZeneca and their vaccine really care about me. I believe the only person who genu genuinely cares about me in my life is me. I don't trust anybody else. So when a government comes along and says, you need to live this way, I realize that's not for the benefit of me. That's for the benefit of the government. No, mate, the government's got screwed over by lockdown, but they had to do it. It was all for the benefit of people that would continue to die if people like Andrew kept spreading the disease. I'm pretty sure no government in the world actually benefited from lockdown and COVID and vaccines, but it was all necessary to protect vulnerable people. People with compromised immune systems, people with cancer, newborn babies, elderly people, people with other underlying health conditions. They needed protecting. They were who we, it was benefiting. They were who we were saving. They were who were important. This wasn't some big conspiracy because, oh, the government fancied mixing it up a bit today. He says, nobody cares about people, right? so I only care about myself. And that's made me a rebel because I only trust me. I trust me, and that's why I can't be programmed. Again, I feel sad for him, because no, people do care about other people. This mindset hasn't made you a rebel, it's made you a sad, lonely little man who's a danger to women. And then there's this huge rant about how the pandemic isn't real, hospitals were never full, people weren't actual dying, and then a comparison to how the UK is basically as bad as Nazi Germany, again, very disrespectful. Um, and then he ends his COVID rant, weirdly, by saying literally out of nowhere, you can't even be a nationalist anymore, and you can't even be an English person who loves England and wants England to be English, and for people to talk your language. You can't do anything. And considering Andrew Tate has been seen hanging out with and supporting Nigel Farage in the past, I think this says a hell of a lot. It, <sighs> That's the thing about Andrew Tate. Every time you think he can't sink any lower, he does. As you'll see throughout this video, every time we think he's hit a low point, he gets worse. What's funny though is that while Andrew spends a lot of time wanting to be an English nationalist who loves England and just wants to make England England again, uh, he also spends a hell of a lot of time complaining about how awful England is and why he prefers Romania where he lives now. Contradictions. That said, despite him being all like, yeah, Romania, he clearly doesn't respect any kind of authority, no matter where it is, and regularly boasts about how much he hates following rules. Uh, he boasts about being a corrupt individual who screws over the masses and puts people in danger. Literally, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So in chapter three, he lists 50 things every man should do. <laughs> and as part of this, he recommends getting into debt and refusing to pay it back, committing tax evasion, and fraud, stealing as much as you can, and sleep with your girlfriend's best friend because, I quote, females have absolutely zero loyalty to each other. And then he goes on in another chapter to brag about dangerous driving. And he tells his followers that they should get multiple driver's licenses in various different countries so you can get away with driving dangerously and keep driving dangerously and endangering people's lives even if you get caught. He says, I drive how I fucking want, I'm not gonna live like a little cock. It's 50 miles an hour, but if I do 55 miles an hour, they take it away from me. This is how people live under government control, suppressed and afraid to lose their license. I get stopped for speeding five times a week. No one does shit because I have so many driver's licenses and you guys should do the same thing. And then he brags more about speeding and all this stuff that he does. And he seems completely oblivious to the fact that these rules aren't just arbitrary, they're in place to keep road users safe, including himself, and he just doesn't care. I genuinely hope this man never ends up killing someone because he thinks he's too good to stick to a speed limit and the other rules of the road. He talks more about his corruption later and he says that this is the reason he chose to move to the Romania from the UK, because he says, Romania is the least civilized of 
a lot of uh, Eastern European countries. Poland is very, very civilized, very clean. Romania is like 20 years behind. It's not civilized and it's also very chaotic and very corrupt. But that suits me because I have money. I like living in a corrupt place when I have money. So if I wanna drive 300 miles an hour, as long as I have money in my pocket, it's not a problem. So I like it here for that reason. And then in a different chapter, he says, and this is long, strap yourself in for this. Romania is, and I probably shouldn't say it, completely corrupt from head to toe. Now I have a very, very extensive network in Romania. I like to make this very clear. One of the reasons I love living there so much is because I'm at the very top echelon of society. If I need to speak to the prime minister, I can make that happen. I can't do that in the West. So we went and met with some members of parliament and they're like, well, it's not us, it's the European Union directing all this COVID lockdown garbage. They knew COVID was a scam, they knew it. Everyone knew it. The European Union gave them billions in relief funds or in reality bribes to do it. So we can't really open the casinos. Then I did a big deal with them to open them on the sly and pay bribes. I was open for the first month with bribes, but the bribe kept going up because this is Romania, right? The police chief would come, he wants some, and the police chief would call his mate. His mate is the fucking, I don't know, fire inspector, some jackass. He'd come, then the alcohol licensing man would come, and it was just like everyone was on the phone to each other. Hey, this casino is still open and they'll pay you to go away. So before you know it, every five minutes, someone's at the door for money, and we weren't making money, so we had to close down, and nobody feels sorry for the casino owner. It's kind of hard to play the pity card. My business has gone, <laughs> My business has gone under, like who gives a shit? Fuck you, you've got a Chiron? And I'm just stuck here right now, uh, but I'm still living my life, traveling the world, driving my cars. I... These stories are just so bizarre and corrupt and exhausting, and I don't understand how he's not in prison already. Now, you might have noticed a pattern so far. Andrew Tate likes money. When he's insecure, he talks about how much money he has. When he's bored, he spends more money. When he's in trouble, he throws money at it, and so on. But what's odd is that he seems to think everyone else has the exact same view as him when it comes to money. So listen to the way he talks about women and money in chapter two titled, Do Girls Love Money? And I'll summarize it for you now. According to Andrew, all women are shallow and too dumb to understand the complexities of how money works. So you need to be a big strong man and show her pretty things so you can put your pee pee in her. I wish I was exaggerating, but that's it. That's the chapter. He says, girls like the trappings of money without seeing the actual money. A girl doesn't want you to sit there and say you earned this much and that you have this and that. They don't give a fuck. What they want is a black Mercedes to pick them up from their house to take them to the restaurant. Then you pay the bill without mentioning how much it is and a black Mercedes to take them home again afterwards. Or they jump in your Lambo and go back to your penthouse and fuck. They don't give a shit how much your heating bill is. They don't care about how much the taxes are on your big ass apartment. They just want your bed to be big and comfortable. They want the trappings of money without the details of how it's made. Another thing females enjoy is men who are successful. And money's a very easy measure of success. On top of that, the number one thing women want more than anything is fun. Women like fun. And you can do anything you want to a woman. You can even be horrible, but do not bore her. As long as you don't bore a female and you're entertaining enough for her to have some enjoyment in her life, she'll always be around. This is why women often like funny guys, for example. Women like fun and money facilitates spontaneity and spontaneity is fun. It's just so odd. He really seems to think everyone's as shallow as he is. It's very bizarre. And then he brags about how a lot of women use him for his money or rather the experiences that his money can bring. And then he like degrades the women for that and he judges them, but then he brags about having done the same thing himself. Very weird double standard. He has absolutely no shame in just using women for whatever he can. So number nine on his list of 50 things every man should do is survive by charm alone. When I was a fighter, before I had a cam company, I had a nice car, but no house. However, I had four girlfriends. They had houses, they also had food, and pussy. I didn't have a house for a year, but I slept and ate and fucked just fine 
every single night. And that's just one example of the massive double standard you'll see throughout Andrew's work. And what's hilarious is that later on he goes on about how like women don't have a business mind and how inept we are with money and business and there's a whole rant about how women don't know how to be financially independent and always need a man to look after them and blah 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 and we'll, we'll get to that later on but what about those women who were financially independent and you were scrounging off it's insane inconsistent pathetic disgusting he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about he's just an angry little man so Andrew spends a lot of time droning on and on about how rich and successful and smart he is. And we know one of the ways he made his money is by bribing government officials so he could illegally open con casinos during a pandemic. But his other big money maker uh, was human trafficking and exploiting sex workers. Or as he likes to call it, having a cam site. Andrew likes to brag about the fact that he lured women from all over the world to come visit him and then he emotionally manipulated them into doing sex work for him sex work in which he would take most of the money and manipulate them further into being scared to leave. I'm not exaggerating, not at all. Let me read you a series of passages. Female beauty is the most valuable thing in the world. Wars were fought and nations ruined over a princess. The number one motivator for men to risk their lives in battle was to be respected enough to have a beautiful woman. Men used to die for beauty, now they pay for it. Understand that a beautiful woman has value. If female beauty has value, Men should pay for it. Every man except you. Pure misogyny and also pure manipulation of the reader or listener or whatever. Like vulnerable men are gonna eat this up and he has taken advantage of that. But yeah, pure, pure misogyny. I do feel like as a woman, my appearance is the least valuable thing about me. And if a man came along and told me like all he saw in me was my appearance, then I'd know he was a douchebag. So how did Andrew get started with this whole camming human trafficking thing? He says, I'm not trying to convince anyone I'm a nice guy because I don't give a shit. I'm telling the truth. So the beginning of it was, I messaged my six girlfriends and told them they're all coming to live with me, that I had a job for them in London. Two of them wouldn't come, four of them agreed, and I told them, we're gonna make a bunch, bunch of money and you're gonna live with me, blah blah blah. So the four girls flew in, I sat them all down at a table, and they're all like, who's this chick? Who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I just sat there, just sat there and said, listen, I've been with you all. I'm starting a webcam business. I'm gonna get rich. Some of you are gonna come with me to the top of the mountain or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. It was very matter of fact. Anyway, two of them left, two of them agreed to stay and the beginning of my cam empire was this tiny little apartment with me and my two girlfriends. Eventually he managed to turn this into apparently running 80 plus webcam girls, 50 plus OnlyFans girls, and generating over 11 million turnover in eight years. I mean, I wouldn't say exploiting other people's bodies is something to brag about, but okay. And absolutely none of this is empowering for the women who work for him because he literally brags about how much he exploits them. He says, I decided I needed money and found a way to monetize female beauty. And then later he says, beautiful women work for me and make me millions of dollars. They obey me because they love me. They clean my house and make me coffee and get naked on demand. That's how I make over 30,000 a month. I own a webcam studio, it's no secret, I've never tried to hide it. That's unethical, cry dorks. But the girls are rich and I am rich. The girls sit on a computer and make huge sums of cash. No man touches them except me. And the men who spend their money on the sites do so willingly. Everybody's happy especially me. And then he tells his fans, you could do the exact same thing. The US or UK is even better than Eastern Europe to run this kind of business. The girls are more stupid. So the fact he acknowledges that people need to be stupid to work for him says everything. <laughs> he speaks of the women working for him in such a disrespectful way by saying, as a pimp, you need good hoes and hoes want to be paid. And then he talks exactly about how he manipulates his hoes to prevent mutiny, and my God, I wish I was joking. I... The pimp game is hard, girls get jealous. The customers come and go, it's highly emotional. Some girls can't take it and bail. They start craving stability. If you show weakness when one leaves, the others will think about leaving. It will inspire mutiny. When I was living with 15 women and one would leave, me and the others would have a small party. FDB party. Fuck dat bitch party. We would talk about how stupid she was to leave. What's she gonna do now? Probably fall in love with some simp. This was important. 
I had many women who stayed because they were afraid of being the subject of an FDB party if they left. They had sat and ripped so many women for leaving, they didn't want to become what they once mocked. They'd rather share me with every other woman in the house and obey. This is literally emotional manipulation. Stay with me and let me exploit your body for profit or I'll public humiliate you in front of all your friends and colleagues. That's manipulation. That's exploitation. And then he explains more about this process later when he says, because he knows he's doing this, he knows it's exploitation and manipulation. He says, I understood the psychology of women and women as a whole are absolute group thinkers. Females are sheep. Everyone says women are complicated. No, they're not. Women are programmable. Women are blank slates and they're even either programmed by you as a man or they're programmed by society. The good wife who obeys her man and cooks for him and cleans for him has been programmed by her man. The woman who goes, I don't need no man, I'm a feminist, has been programmed by society and by the BBC. They're programmed. They're all born blank and someone inserts the programming. This is also a weird thing. He's really against the BBC for some reason. He hates it. So then girls didn't want to quit because they knew there'd be a party about them and they didn't want that. I had girls come to me saying, look, I have to leave. I'm sorry, I really have to leave. Please don't throw a party. They were all so scared of all the girls who used to know them, mocking them behind their back. I never exploited anybody. I never hit a girl. I never hurt anybody. I didn't even have to raise my voice. So he... <laughs> He straight up admits it's manipulation, straight up, and then has the cheek to say, but it wasn't exploitation. Like, there's literally no justifying this. You can't be like, I never exploited anybody, while literally explaining in detail how you exploited them. It's unbelievable. The denial of this man. He's delusional too, he's absolutely delusional. So he says of these women who worked for him, she needs me. How could she do any of this without me? What about the taxes? What about the day it was quiet online and I changed her room around and got it busy? What about that crazy customer who's scaring her? What about that forum that found out her real name? Who does she come to? Who has the answer every time? Her man. Women can't handle the emotion of doing this alone. They need a rock. They need instruction. If a woman truly respects you, she wants to be your robot. Go here and do this. You can't make this crap up, can you? She wants to be your robot. <laughs> Another example. If a girl is doing it by herself and the computer fucks up, she can't fix it. If the tax man calls, she can't fix it. I say this as a woman who works for herself and has a business degree and lives alone. This is laughable. I am literally trained to do my own accounting and taxes. I literally build and rearrange my furniture myself because I'm a capable adult. I handle obsessive fans myself because I'm an adult who can take care of herself. If my computer messes up, I fix it myself because I'm good with tech. The idea of needing a man to do these basic tasks for me and agreeing to be his robot in return for like the bare minimum of him doing stuff I could do myself is laughable. He really, he really thinks he's onto something. He's like, yeah, I do so much. I can do taxes. It's like, yeah, mate, you and millions of other people. It's not that hard. And you know what? Maybe I could, well, I don't think I could, but maybe I could forgive this stuff if the women were at least being paid fairly, but they aren't. He manipulates these women into sleeping with him and thinking they love him so that they give him a bigger percentage of the money that they make. He says, the girls who loved me and worked for me, my main girlfriends, they probably get around 20% of their money. I'd keep 80% of the money they made, so they basically work for free. They worked for my love and attention. This is exploitation. And this is how Andrew Tate made most of his money. And this is what he's bragging about. But you know what? This isn't even the worst thing he's ever done to women. Not at all. So let's move on to the next section. It just keeps getting worse, right? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> there is so much to cover in this section, I almost don't know where to start. But there's this interview that he does with his brother that I think sums up the two guys' views on women pretty perfectly. So this is Andrew's brother Tristan speaking, not Andrew, but they both admit to sharing the feeling. Tristan says, I don't like any women. I fuck plenty of women. I don't like them. <laughs> Ridiculous, it's pathetic. It's like a child, isn't he? And then Andrew then goes on to talk more about how women should never be your friend and the only thing or value from any woman is the ability to have sex with them. It is pure, ridiculous objectification. A woman should never be your best friend. Now I know most of you guys who follow me are not little baby pussy hoes, 
but there are baby pussy hoes out there who consider having women as friends. But men and women shouldn't be friends. If I'm going to sit and talk to you and give you my brilliant personality, <laughs> then I'm fucking you or I'm trying to fuck you. That's it. I don't need female friends. I'm not interested in the things females are interested in. It, it just gets worse. It gets worse and worse. I don't see the point in having female friends. Any real G out there knows it's true. You got your girl or your girls. Girls you're fucking, girls you're trying to fuck. There's no room for that other shit. And why doesn't he want women as friends? Oh, well, it makes perfect sense. Women are not combat ready. <laughs> so if you're running through the world with a bunch of chicks, what are you gonna do when shit goes down? Now, if you sit out here going, well, I don't actually get jumped, you probably live a boring ass life. I have absolutely no words. Oh my God. And then we get some more absolutely laughable delusion when Andrew starts bragging. This is so bad, right? My kind of pussy is on a different echelon. I'm, a, I'm rolling in the highest possible echelon of female beauty. I'm a millionaire kickboxing world champion. I'm what every girl's ever fucking dreamed of. Like, he can't be for real, right? He cannot possibly be this delusional, surely. No woman with an ounce of self-respect would go near Andrew Tate. Not one, and I'm gonna say this now, right? If you are a woman watching this video and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know what? No, I think in the right circumstances, I might sleep with Andrew Tate. Please, for your own sake, go and get some therapy because you need it. Normally I wouldn't judge anyone for who they wanna sleep with, but if that person is Andrew Tate, I am worried about you. I am genuinely worried about you. And then he discusses how he likes to isolate women from other men completely, which is straight out of the abuser's handbook, right? He says, imagine being the only man in a woman's life because you're the only man she needs. No boss, no friends, nothing. You're the only male she ever interacts with. Do you understand how much more a woman would respect you if you were everything she needed? Mate, that's not a woman respecting you. That's a woman being manipulated by you and ending up with no other options. That's not respect. He says, imagine your girl looking at you knowing she truly believes you're the best man in the world. If she goes to work and her male boss tells her what to do so she can earn some money because you don't earn enough, then there's another male who's above her in her eyes. I take care of my women. The only man who bosses them around is me. <laughs> he is terrifying and delusional and dangerous. Like, this is not okay. It's like, I've spoken about this before, but back when I was in an abusive relationship, it was quite easy for him because I was already pretty <laughs> isolated from my friends by having moved to Leeds during lockdown and not knowing anyone. And he continued to isolate me further as time went on. And he wouldn't let me listen to anyone else. He wouldn't let me speak about the relationship to anyone else. But when I read Dr. Romani's book, Should I Stay or Should I Go? I realized just how common of a tactic this was of abusers. So she writes in her book, your social isolation works quite nicely for your narcissistic partner. He may even be the one who wanted it. He may have shared negative opinions or insults about your friends or family, and he may perceive the disdain with which your loved ones view him, or he may perceive the disdain with which your loved ones view him. The more socially isolated you become, the more the skewed reality with your narcissistic partner becomes your only reality. You lose the sounding boards who can calibrate you back to recognizing your worth, who remind you what empathy looks like, who provide perspective, and who engage with you in the mutual and reciprocal way human relationships should operate. Social support and social networks are good for our health and our well-being. And this is exactly what I see in Andrew's comments. He's like, no, I'm the only man. He's attempting to socially isolate women and be controlling, and that's not okay. That is a tactic of an abuser. Then we come back to this recurring theme of women can't do anything. You just, ooh, ooh, women. Women so weak and stupid. We've seen it many times in this video already, except this time it's super explicit. He says, what's really interesting and it's gonna really piss the feminists off, but I'll tell you, it's the truth. It doesn't matter whether a woman wants to be a lawyer or a housemaker or a webcam girl. Unless she has a man directing her, she's gonna fuck up. No, <laughs> that's not how the world works, Andrew. 
I think almost every woman I know is more capable and mature and independent and has more self-confidence and self-respect and is more secure within themselves than Andrew Tate is. They're just not built to be completely independent creatures. The women who go, I'm strong and independent. They're working for a man in a company and getting fucked by 10 men a month. You're not independent. It's a lie. You're just undesirable. It's what you are. There's no such thing as an independent female. They're all relying on a man to some degree. And if a woman wants to be very, very successful in her life, no matter what it is, whether she wants to be a gymnast or whatever she wants to be, at some point, there's a man in charge telling her what to do. God, no. This, this is actually like quite funny to me because this is something men like to say to me all the time in the comments. They're like, oh, you think you're so independent, but where would you be without all your male fans? You need men to keep you alive. Like they always say stuff like that to me. And like, yeah, I have a few male fans in my audience. But what I don't think many people realise is that my audience is about 75% female. Sometimes that goes up to around 80%, depending on when in the year it is. I'm not reliant on the men in my audience at all. That said, of course I have male viewers. Of course some of the products and programmes I use in creating my videos were made by men. Um, I'm making this video now because of a book written by men. Like, of course men exist in the world and play a part of my job. No one human is completely independent of anyone else. And it turns out there are people of all different genders in the world. You can't just ignore 50 odd percent of the population. Apparently that's not possible. That's weird, isn't it? Gorgeous girl. But to say I'm an independent woman doesn't mean I exist in a vacuum and I've never claimed it does. Okay, you comfy. Good girl, thank you. And to be independent to me means that I'm not reliant on a man or a set of men in particular. Not that, that I live in isolation from everyone else in the world. You got something to say? Independent young lady? It's funny because the same men who tell me things like, oh, damn woman, like, you're not independent because you're using an editing program that had men on the team. You know, like that sort of rubbish. Like, they're the same ones that forget, yeah, and you're using a hell of a lot of stuff that women had a role in producing and making too. Like, angry men always seem to overlook the accomplishments of women, so often. Like, a lot of men like to be like, oh, this world was built on men, men did everything, men did blah, 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 blah. and they talk about male soldiers in World War II, but then forget about all the female nurses. They forget about the women working in factories, like the munitions factories back home. They forget about the women working in Bletchley Park, who basically won as World War II. And I know, right? And how without women, we'd have been screwed in that war. It was absolutely a joint effort between men and women, and the world isn't built purely on the shoulders of men, like people like Andrew Tate try and fool us into thinking it was. To say men did everything, men built this, men, men built it all, men, like, it's completely untrue and delusional to think that. Isn't it, babe? Yes. And then he gets worse when he says, in general, I don't think females are good for helping you anyway. I can never think of a time I had a problem and I called a woman and told her my problem and the problem went away. I could literally never think of that, unless I've got a boner that needs fixing. Besides that one issue, I've never thought of the time I've called a girl and said I've got this issue, I need money, or fuck, someone's out to kill me, or I've been stabbed, or whatever, and a girl said something that wasn't just garbage. Women don't... They can't help with problems. The problem with having a wife as your partner and your teammate is what the fuck can she do? Women are not combat ready. I know, do you think that's silly? Do you? Do you think that's silly? You're combat ready, aren't you? You've saved my life. You've protected me. Love you. My little combat girl. Have you been licking all my lipstick off? It's absolutely ridiculous in every way. And then, because Andrew has been accused on numerous occasions of sexual assault and rape and violence against women, often with video evidence, he does this typical misogynist thing of complaining about the Me Too movement. It's old at this point. You know, I've never heard a man who wasn't a misogynist in some way complain about women having the courage to expose men who sexually assault them. Men who've never assaulted women fully support it, you know? Funny that, isn't it? But of course he likes to rant and he says, Me too, the sexual assault bullshit has fucked up the Western world. 
You need to put a time limit on sexual assault allegations. You do this for two reasons. One, it prevents fucking psychos coming up with accusations from 33 years ago, which can never possibly be proved or disproved. You can never prove or disprove something from 30 years ago. There's no physical evidence. It's your word against theirs. It's garbage, let's end that shit. Two, it'll inspire people to come forward straight away if there is a genuine incident and a genuine allegation. I suppose these girls go, well, I was scared to say anything, but now that I'm 68 and might get some money from Trump, now I found the courage. Because the problem is, it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But with this sexual assault bullshit, you're guilty until proven innocent. If a girl comes forward and claims he raped me back in 1988, you're a rapist. They have no proof. It hasn't gone to court, you haven't been convicted, but you're a rapist in everyone's eyes until you somehow prove she's lying. How the fuck am I gonna prove a bitch is lying about something that happened in 1988? But for the same reason she can't prove it happened, I can't prove it didn't happen, and then you're just stuck with a fucking smear campaign, a bunch of garbage when you haven't even done anything wrong. This sounds like a man who knows he's assaulted women, and we know he has because there's video evidence and police reports, and he's just trying to get in early and discredit his victims. That's what this reads as to me. And then this next bit is absolutely laughable. What we've done is we've weaponized sexual assault allegations. They've been weaponized. We've given every female in the Western world a weapon, and that weapon does not have to be used fairly. Yeah, as opposed to back in the good old days when the only people with weapons were the men who could sexually assault or use violence against any woman they wanted and get away with it. Sure miss those days. I'm at the point now that when I talk to girls in the West, I have to fucking archive my text messages. I got shit fucking archived. If you've got money, this shit happens. Make 10 mil, that shit's gonna happen to you. If a girl wants to go to the police about me now, I'll be like, all right, wait, wait, wait. I'll open up that folder. Here, look, prove she's a bimbo. Why do I have to live that way? Isn't that insane? Call me crazy, but just because you don't respect a woman and call her a bimbo, that doesn't mean you didn't assault her. He says, this Me Too era has not protected women. It's destroyed the safety of men. It's no longer safe to be a heterosexual male who enjoys sex in the Western world. It's no longer safe. I think that is the most privileged thing I've ever read. And now, let's move on to talk specifically about what Andrew Tate thinks about relationships and dating and staying faithful in a relationship. And again, I warn you, it's bad. <laughs> so, straight up, Andrew thinks that commitment and faithfulness isn't possible in a relationship unless you're a woman, and then it's a requirement. More double standards, and this time a super, super gross one. Take this story. I had four girlfriends, and my brother had four girlfriends. Me and my brother, with eight women living in one house, and all the women adored us, and they obeyed us. And at the peak, I was turning over 400 grand a month with eight girls, and people always ask if those girls slept with any other people, seeing as me and Tristan were sleeping with four each. No, they didn't. That's cheating. A woman can't do that. That's cheating. I can do it because I'm a man. If a woman sleeps with multiple people, that's cheating. That's absolutely unacceptable on every level. That's unacceptable. And I hear you ask, what is his bizarre reasoning for this? Well, let Tate tell you. Men and women are not the same. We've never been the same. This idea that men and women are the same is complete garbage. For the longest period of human history, men had a role and women had a role. Men have never been faithful, ever. Look at history. Every single king, every single sultan had more than one woman. Mate, Andrew, buddy. You're no king or sultan. You're more like an earthworm who's just been chopped in half by a shovel. But I also love how he completely overlooks and ignores actual history, which had so many powerful women, so many faithful men, so many gay and bisexual people in positions of power, literally anything that doesn't fit his narrow worldview. He just ignores and pretends didn't happen, and it's ridiculous. But it gets worse as well. He says, Female promiscuity has always been frowned upon since the dawn of human time. In fact, only a hundred years ago, you couldn't get married unless you were a virgin. It was the only thing that mattered because it ensures paternity, before paternity tests. 
How else do you know that kid is yours unless she was a virgin? I don't think he knows how sex and pregnancy works, does he? <laughs> it was the only way to be sure. For the longest period of human time, the idea of a promiscuous female has been frowned upon and shamed. In half of the world today, it's still shamed. So a woman can't go around fucking people and pretend it's the same as a man running around fucking people. It's absolutely not the same. I mean, in some ways he's right. For a long time, women expressing their sexuality in any way has been shamed and suppressed. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it natural. It makes it oppressive and disgusting and a consequence of a patriarchal society that treated women as no more than cattle to be bought and sold by men. Just because something happened for a long time, that doesn't make it okay. Was slavery okay because that happened for a long time? How about genocide? We've seen lots of genocides throughout history happen over and over again. So that must be natural and normal too, right? We should just go along with that. We should accept that. We should just be like, you know what? Pro-genocide, according to Andrew Tate's logic, which is crap and makes no sense. A man can only cheat if he loves someone else. If I have a woman who I truly love, I can go out and fuck someone I don't care about and then come back to her. That's not cheating, that's exercise. I don't think Andrew Tate actually knows what love is. I don't think he's capable of love. But if she even talks to a dude, then it's cheating because females are emotionally invested. I have no emotional investment, so no, and I'll make this very, very clear, any woman who was with me never spoke to any man beside me and my brother and the men that were paying them online. That's it. They were absolutely loyal to me, and if they weren't, they got fired. What a ridiculous, illogical double standard. He just wants to control women. He is abusive. That is it. And he says that if a woman does get upset with him for being with other women, he doesn't care because he literally doesn't care about anyone but himself. As long as he's not being physically hurt, he doesn't care what happens to anyone else because he's a selfish douche douchebag. He writes, So I've had this saying for a long time. My saying is, what are they going to do? Fight me. And I use it a lot. My girlfriend catches me cheating. Well, what's she going to do? Fight me? Like, what were you going to do? The point is, unless someone's going to get violent with you, what other repercussions really are there? Everything else is just wishy-washy bullshit. Everything is just talk. Just words. If they're not going to put their hands on you, none of it's real. It's just talk. It's just garbage. Hey, God, he repeats himself so much, doesn't he? He just... Oh. That's what I've noticed with, like, all this book. There is so much unnecessary swearing and so much repetition of him just saying the same thing over and over and over because he doesn't actually have the vocabulary to express himself properly and succinctly and clearly. He's not smart enough to do that. Sorry, where were we? If they're not going to put their hands on you, none of it's real. It's just talk. It's just garbage. And it also demonstrates how important the consequence of something is. Cheat on my girlfriend. What's she going to do? Or she might leave. She might cry. She might complain. She might, but she isn't going to come up and stab me. Well, maybe she'll try. And if she does, I'm very prepared. Don't come at me with some knife spouting, spouting this fucking bimbo shit you see in movies. You cheated. Fucking get the fuck out of here talking about cheating. Of course I did, now put the knife down or use it and go and make me a fucking sandwich. Again, this reads like it should be satire, but it's not, and that is terrifying. And if this woman doesn't want to be with him or acts like he does, then he just publicly shames her. It's ridiculous. He says, the only kind of girl who I can't get instant loyalty from is a complete whore. And guess what? A complete whore even if I gave up everything for her, would eventually continue down the path of being a complete whore because whores are whores. The amount of derog derogatory language towards women is disgraceful. It's just, it, again, this double standard. He sleeps around because he's a perfect man, but if a woman does it, she's a complete whore. It's childish. It's ridiculous. Well, you know what? I would rather be a complete whore than let Andrew Tate within 50 feet of me. And then he ends with some delusion about how all women want him and how he genuinely believes that, and I quote, good women, when they meet a man like me, they're loyal because there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> Trust me, mate, good women can and should go anywhere that isn't near you. <laughs> You've been fucked by the boss. You're not going to be fucked by them. 
I don't even have to try and make you loyal. You've had enough of a brain to look at me and realize anyone after me is doing no <laughs> and realize anyone after me is nothing but a downgrade. There's nowhere for you to go, bitch. <laughs> He's actually delusional. It's so backwards. And I say this with no snark and all sincerity. Nearly any other man in the world would be an upgrade compared to Andrew Tate. Now, Andrew Tate doesn't currently have children, thank God, but he wants children and he's very vocal about this fact. In fact, he believes one of the 50 things every man should do in their life is have kids. Why else are you alive? Why else are you learning? If you have no one to teach, every man should aim to have children, but don't let your life end because of it. Continue being you and maintain your freedom. And this is terrifying to me because of course he's one of these men who just sees women as breeders who exist purely to get pregnant and look after the kids. His ego is so big that he thinks he just owes the world the right to his exquisite DNA and if he does have kids then he can just let them out into the world and that's it, his job is done. Um, and if he doesn't have them then he's, he's denying us something. Spoiler, he wouldn't be. But you know, it's this last bit that's the problem. Don't let your entire life end because of it. Continue being you and maintain your freedom. By which he means he's gonna impregnate a woman and then make her do all the hard work. He doesn't wanna take care of the kids himself. Pump your DNA into someone, make them carry it, make them go through this horrific pregnancy, make them go through this horrific childbirth and then raise the kid alone. He's not gonna take any responsibility. I hate this kind of person who focuses so much on getting someone pregnant and a baby being born, but not on bothering to actually raise the child and form them into a good person. It is disgusting. Plus, I can think of many, 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 many other reasons to be alive other than having kids. In fact, most reasons to be alive are better than having kids, but maybe I just say that as a woman who's child-free by choice. But Andrew thinks there is something defective with women like me. He thinks I'm not a real woman, I'm not feminine enough, I should be ashamed of myself. According to Andrew, I think that every single person should be aiming to reproduce. And I think the most important thing anyone can do in their life is to have children. I'm super pro-children. When I speak to some of these feminists spouting, I don't want kids. I think you're the most miserable, stupid bitch in the world. You're born with the gifts to create life, and you think it's more important to eat microwave dinners, make 40 grand a year, and talk about your career? You're an idiot. I think that you truly live forever through your genes and through your blood. <laughs> There's only one idiot here, Andrew, and it's not me. <laughs> There's only one miserable person here, and it's not me. <laughs> this is really, truly pathetic on his part. He really thinks that the only thing he has to leave as a legacy is his DNA. So how dull is his life? <sighs> Actually, as we established earlier, it's very dull. But if all you have to pass on is your genes and not your experiences or the work you've done or the ways you've helped people, then that just says to me how little you actually contribute to the world around you. It's very sad. I think you truly live forever through your actions and through making a positive impact on the world. Something which I can safely say Andrew Tate has never done and will probably never do. And then finally he brings us all back to why he thinks feminism is rubbish and he says, I don't think the world has ever been equal. I do believe we should have equal rights under the law. I'm not saying women should be slaves. Oh, how nice of him, because he basically admitted he's been using some women as sex slaves and exploiting their bodies for money, but I guess the only women who should be slaves in Andrew's eyes are the hot ones, right? So I get it, I get it. He doesn't want all women to be slaves, just some of us. A woman's job was always procreation and to look after the family, to look after the men. That's all they had to do. And the man would go out there and risk his life and spend his time building the modern world. Men are still out there building the modern world. But when they come home now, the girls are like, oh, why should I cook for you? I think women are failing in their world. This is an absolute joke, it's ridiculous. What the hell has Andrew Tate done to build the modern world other than be corrupt, exploit some people and make everyone miserable and literally be the subject of his violent, dangerous behaviour? Ridiculous. Um, and then just when you thought this book couldn't get any worse, he likes to throw in a little sprinkling of homophobia and transphobia. And it's not only hateful, but it's a tired old cliche. You've decided that having sex with women isn't for you. You don't want to have children. You want to have sex with other men. Fine. 
It's your decision and you're entitled to it. That does not give you the right to go to other people's families, people who did decide to have children and raise them properly and try and program their children. Leave the kids alone. So ridiculous. You can be as transgender as you like, but don't come talk to my kid about it. That's my child. I will program my child with my world views. I raise them. I pay for them. They're my kid. They're not your kid. And they're not the government's kid. How is this not a joke? How is this not satire? Gay and transgender people don't decide to be gay or transgender. They just are. And by teaching kids and young people that gay and transgender people exist, it's not brainwashing, it's not convincing them of something, it's just letting them know that it's safe for them to be exactly who they are, whether that's gay or straight or bi or cis or trans or anything at all. It's just letting people know that, hey, these people exist, be tolerant of others, and be exactly who you are. There's no brainwashing there. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The only person here who is wanting to indoctrinate kids is Andrew Tate because he literally admits it. Let me just read you that bit one more time. That's my child. I will program my child with my world views. I raise them, I pay for them, they're my kid. That's the only indoctrination going on here. <sighs> and with that absolute nightmare, we are done today. Thank you for watching. This video has taken me so long to work on I have had so many long nights, it has been emotionally exhausting, and I have a long, long bout of editing ahead of me, and I'm going to be very exhausted. But I'm so glad I've made this video, because what he's saying is ridiculous, but it's so important to remind people that this is all nonsense, and why it's nonsense, and what the reality of this situation is. I guess for a moment I just want to speak to all the women in my audience and say if you ever come across a man like Andrew Tate in your real life or online or anywhere, please just run. Just in the opposite direction, as far away as you can, as quickly as you can, just go, leave. Don't try and change him, don't try and think, oh, it'll be different, no, just go. Just absolutely leave. He is a ridiculous, terrifying character who is a danger to so many people. And these people just need leaving alone and isolating and being called out from a distance because they are so horrifically dangerous. Um, and to everyone else watching, if you're a fan of Andrew Tate, please stop. If you know someone who's a fan of Andrew Tate, who listens to what he says, who pays for his content, who promotes his stuff, then please, again, from a distance, try and educate them, please try and help change their mind, and don't let them suck you into this misogynistic, hateful, insecure little world, you know? Um, but for now, I would love to hear your thoughts on Andrew Tate and this book and everything you said down in the comments. Um, thank you so, so much for watching. It would be great if you enjoyed this video, if you would leave a like, leave a comment, share it around on social media, all that stuff really helps me. If you're new here, it would be wonderful if you subscribe to my channel because I review more books, I talk about social issues and give my commentary on them. I also occasionally do little videos on science and history and poetry and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So it would be great to have you along for the journey. But for now, I am exhausted. I have been talking for literally two hours at this point. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I've been filming for two hours and I'm tired, but <laughs> I'm glad it's done. I'm glad we got through this together. Thank you for watching today. I appreciate your health a lot and I'll see you all again really, really soon.